Neil deGrasse Tyson is most famous for saying that he loves AI-generated Asian girls. But what has often gone under the radar is another profound quote from him, which is quantum computing. Yeah, I don't know. He just stopped there. Quantum computing, the core of movies like Ant-Man and Into the Spider-Verse, and rumored to harness the power of parallel universes, changing the world as we know it today. But what actually is it, and how does it work? Well, today we're going to be going over pretty much all of this, from trying to prove the existence of parallel universes, to going over how one would make a quantum computer, all the way to coding a quantum algorithm on a real quantum computer. But yeah, honestly, this stuff's actually just super cool. So, let's head right in. Ah! So before we talk about what quantum computing is, let's talk about why it's so good. Remember last time we said that normal computers can do multiple things at the same time with multiple cores? Nah, you don't remember? Bro, come on. Well anyways, yeah they can, and this is called parallelism. So normal computers use this parallelism to speed things up, but this is limited by the number of physical cores the computer has. Now on a quantum computer, it has a similar sense of parallelism, but instead of using multiple cores, it uses the power of multiple parallel universes. So that's kind of crazy, right? And you might be thinking, no way there's parallel universes. Well, there are. And let's try to show this through an experiment. Okay, so this is a version of the double slit experiment. You guys might actually have to focus for this part because I don't know, it might get complicated. Okay, so we're gonna use a photon gun on the left that shoots tiny particles of light called photons through a foil with one or two holes. We then see where the photon lands on the wall after passing through these holes. And I couldn't do this at home because I don't have a photon gun, but scientists did it in the lab. Oh no! So, when the foil has one hole, after we shoot through enough photons, we get this dot pattern on the right, and all the photons land only within this dot pattern. And now when we add a hole, we expect the photons to just land within two of these dot patterns, right? Because some of the photons will just go through the top hole like before, and now some of them will go through the bottom hole resulting in another dot pattern. Well, actually, what we observe is that it lands within an entirely different pattern. So I would say this is really weird because if you just think about it, like take the first photon that we're shooting, for example, it has to go through only one hole. So say the photon is going through this top hole, and it's gonna land within this dot pattern. But when there's another hole that just exists, but the photon doesn't even know about it or go through it, then the photon somehow doesn't want to land within this dot anymore. So how can we explain this? Well, one conclusion is that there's a certain something that acts like our photon that exists as a result of our other hole. It then pushes aside the photon that we see to result in this pattern. And in the animation, it's this little green thing. So this something behaves exactly like our photon, except for the fact that we can't see it. It exists though because we can observe it affecting the photon that we can see. This something is actually observed and baked into quantum mechanics, and they're real matter and energy that we just can't see. As a result, we describe it as part of a whole another parallel world of matter, or a parallel universe. It does not end there. Now when we add a detector to see which hole the photon goes through, something wacky happens. The pattern goes away when the detector is on, and we get the expected dot patterns. It's as if the act of just seeing which hole the photon goes through makes this invisible parallel universe shit go away. One conclusion from this is that the photon is actually in multiple states at the same time. Specifically in this case, there's one state where it goes through the top hole, and there's another state where it goes through the bottom hole. The photon is in these two states until we use a detector to see which hole the photon goes through, and at that point, our universe is then entangled or tied to the specific reality. And because the photon had an equal chance of going through either hole, there's a parallel universe that exists in which the photon goes through the other hole, branching out into another reality. This idea of multiple branching realities applies for every tiny little thing that happens in the world, which leads to the concept of infinite parallel universes. And yeah, this is called the many worlds interpretation, and it's one interpretation of quantum mechanics. Hopefully that makes sense at a high level. If it doesn't, don't even worry about it. Just know that there's parallel universes. Wow, amazing. So now let's take a second to hear from a sponsor. The only problem is that I couldn't get a sponsor. So, as Oppenheimer once said, you have to do things yourself. Um, and so we now have merch. Guys, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but it looks like this. And yeah, guys, this is the t-shirt. The quality is really good. We also have a hoodie. And yeah, it actually looks sick. This is embroidered. 
So yeah, head over to nangshop.com. I'll leave a link in the description. And you guys can use the code QUANTUM for 10% off your entire order. All of the funds will go directly to the YouTube endeavor. So yeah, please support the channel. And yeah, let's head back into the video. So now let's talk about quantum computing and how it compares to classical computing on a normal computer. So to start, normal computers use something called bits to store information. These bits are binary, meaning that they can either hold a value of zero or one. And with this, we're able to make, I don't know, like the entire internet. Now on a quantum computer, it uses something called qubits. These qubits can also hold a value of zero or one, but they can also be both at the same time. And this is called superposition. So qubits can be in states both 0 and 1, but what's interesting is at the moment that we measure the qubit's value, it has to snap to either one of these values, either 0 or 1, based on its internal probabilities that we can edit. This is kind of like when my uncle Kenny got accused of touching children at my elementary school, and so he was both in states guilty and non-guilty at the same time until the date of his court trial, where he was incorrectly charged guilty and sentenced to life in jail. Anyways, my point is that these qubits can be in both states 0 and 1 at the same time until the point where it's measured where it has to collapse to one of these values. And so you might be thinking, who cares? Well, on a classical computer, for a large input, you can only be in one out of the total possible states at a given time. What this means is that on a normal computer, we have to do calculation on each input state one at a time. And this can be pretty slow even when we add more cores. However, on a quantum computer, because of superposition, you can be in all of these total possible states at the same time. As a result, on a quantum computer, all the calculation done for the entire input space happens at the same time in parallel universes. What? The quantum computer then observes how these calculations interact, giving us the useful result in exponentially less time. What? This is actually crazy because it would change the world as we know it today. For example, it would be able to decrypt almost every password that we have so people can log into bank accounts and stuff. And actually a lot of hackers right now are actually storing these encrypted passwords so that when quantum computers are ready, they can be decrypted. Personally for me, I have all of Neil deGrasse Tyson's passwords saved and I'm gonna get to the bottom of what he's hiding. But yeah, honestly, it's pretty cool and we're gonna see exactly how it works in a bit. But for now, let's take a look at exactly how we can make our own quantum computer. You guys know Gideon, right? Marcus Cousins III? Well, he's actually really invested in the field of quantum computing and went to a quantum lab and I thought it was pretty cool. But yeah, now let's go to a real quantum fabrication lab. What's up guys? So we're here at the NYU Center of Quantum Information Physics. And today's topic is gonna be how do people make a quantum computer? So yeah, Lucas. Take it away. Yeah, sure, thanks. So there are three main parts in making a quantum computer. So the first part of making a quantum computer is the materials growth. So this is where we actually make our material stacks that we then use to make computer chips later. Then two is the nano fabrication. So this is where we actually make the circuits, patterns, and devices that go into a quantum computer. These are the actual computer chips. And then the third part is the measurement and characterization. And so this is what we use to interrogate what devices we made, how they work, and how we can possibly make them better. The first thing, like I said, is molecular beam epitaxy. This is what we use to actually grow our samples. When you actually make a material stack, right? So you make these wafers that have, you know, silicon or germanium or whatever you use in a computer chip, the way these material stacks are made is that you take a wafer, which is a substrate, and you sequentially plate material on top of it, right? And so the way that you do that is by molecular beam attacks. When we start the growth, what happens is the, the sources are heated up, these are some of the sources, they're heated up to a really, really high temperature. And when they heat up to this high temperature, they go from the solid phase to the gas phase and diffuse across your chamber. And when they diffuse across your chamber, they can hit on top of your sample and plate onto your sample. And so by controlling the temperature, we control the rate of that solid to gas transition. And that's what lets us determine how much we're growing. So the next step in the device making process is fabrication. And so what we do is use a technique mainly called electron beam lithography to define our circuits and wires that we actually use on our chips. And so the way this technique works, I have my chip right here. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to cover my chip with a polymer. And the point of it is that we can then shoot a beam of electrons at it to crack it, okay? 
So say I wanted to write something like Nang. So basically everywhere that the polymer was that the electron beam didn't touch is completely just left as normal. But everywhere that the electron beam touched, you broke your polymer. Then what I can do is wash away the rest of the polymer and just leave the chip with Nang on it. And so we have the chip, but we have features defined in this chip at a very, very precise level. These features can be tens of nanometers. Wow. So they're really, really small, and you can define very, very thin features. So this is electron beam lithography. It's one of the most powerful techniques that we use, and it's kind of what allows us to make the qubits that we make. This is one of our measurement labs. In this lab, we have two dilution refrigerators. They are here and here, and they're like these big metal cases of dilution refrigerators. And inside this dilution refrigerator is probably the thing that most of you would recognize when you Google a quantum computer. So when you Google a quantum computer, there's going to be probably a picture of something that looks like a chandelier. It's like this thing with a bunch of different stages. It's like a sciencey steampunk chandelier. It looks really weird. But what that is, is the cooling stages of a dilution refrigerator. And so at each plate, you get down to a certain temperature and that temperature decreases as you go down and down and down the fridge. And so the actual quantum computer is just a really small chip about this size and it's at the bottom of the dilution fridge in a little cage and so you don't actually see the chip most of the time when someone shows you a quantum computer what they're actually showing you is all of the kind of surrounding hardware that encases that chip to make it cold enough to actually work so just so you know for example if you warm the qubit up warm if you warmed it up to 600 to 700 millikelvin so even below one Kelvin, you basically lose all your information. So you have to get these things really, really, really cold in order for them to actually work. Wow, what an amazing tour. Now let's code up a quantum algorithm that shows the power of quantum computing. And guys, I know it might seem like I could have a hard on for quantum computing, but just wait till the end of the video because by the end, you might have one too. All right, so imagine you're in a game show and the host tells you this. So I have a list of numbers and I have labeled using one of three rules, all of them zero, all of them one, or half of them zero and half of them one. Each minute you can ask me about a number and I will tell you if it's labeled, labeled zero or one. You win the game by telling me which rule I used. Dang, what are you making me record, bro? Dude, I'm done recording this shit. You're not even paying me, bro. Fuck this shit. Guys, go check out youtube.com slash frime. So how would you or a normal computer win this game? Well, I'll just tell you that the best and pretty much only way that you can win this game is to ask about half the numbers plus an additional number. This way, if you get back all zeros, you know that the rule used was to label them all zeros. And if you get back all ones, you know that the rule used was to label them all one. But this is pretty ass because if you can just imagine, if you can only ask one question per minute and you have 10 billion numbers, like this dusty ass motherfucker would definitely have, then you would straight up not live long enough to win the game. But if we use a quantum computer, we can get the answer in one question or one minute. Remember these qubits are in super position or in more than one state at a time. So actually our single input can represent the entire input domain or every possible number in one question. We're gonna run this through our algorithm and at the end, it'll tell us which rule is used. Ah, shit. What a grind. All right, yeah, hopefully that makes sense so far. And now let's take a look at exactly how a quantum scientist would code this up. So coding on a quantum computer uses something called a quantum circuit. This is an algorithm that puts our qubits through gates that changes their probabilities such that at the end, it'll provide a useful result. For this problem, it's a known algorithm called the deutsch jasa algorithm, and this is the circuit for it. There's a lot of math that goes into why it works, but honestly, don't even worry about it. At a high level, it uses something called phase kickback to work, and I'll leave articles about this in the description. Coding this now is actually pretty straightforward once we know the algorithm, because we can just go through line by line and add the gates. And now in 2023, we can use a library to connect to IBM's real quantum computer to run our algorithm. And honestly, they could just be totally scamming me by running this on a simulator, but it's whatever. So yeah, let's run our program. And while we wait, why don't we take a look back at how far we've come and really appreciate the technology that we're using. Oh, 
Oh yeah. shit guys, it actually uh, finished running and we see that it gets the correct answer in one run. One last thing that's actually pretty interesting. So you know how in our double slit experiment, the pattern that we saw was only rendered once we put the detector to see which hole the photon goes through? And you know how in video games, only certain parts of the world are rendered once the player wants to observe that part of the world? Well, there's a theory that says that this could be evidence that we're in a simulation, except for the fact that the computer that we would be running on would be way past our comprehension of computers today. If you ask me, we're being run on a future quantum computer and <laughs> they really just made me an NPC making YouTube videos. God damn it. I would say that quantum computing just has unlimited potential right now. Honestly, we barely scratched the surface because it would just take forever to explain all of it. And yeah, I would say that as quantum computing develops, it's definitely gonna change the field of cryptography, CS, simulations, AI, and probably just a bunch of other stuff that I'm not mentioning. So yeah, very exciting. This is a CMU course on quantum computing that I took online. So I'm gonna leave a link to the full course if you guys wanna take a look in the description. That's about it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I guess now we can just take some time to talk about some updates. Okay, so the first update is merch. You guys should definitely check that out and hopefully support the channel. I actually think the quality of it is really good. And the next update is that we actually hit 100K subscribers, which is super cool. I'm really glad you guys are liking the videos. And yeah, I'll say that 100K was just a big goal. So hopefully we can just keep going on this. All right, but enough about me. You know, at the end of these videos, I always try to inspire you guys or whatever. So I wanted to talk about having goals. So I think for some areas of life, setting a goal and actually achieving it is really worthwhile and fulfilling, obviously. But if you think about it, if you don't put in the work, then you probably will never be able to experience this. So I feel like if you think about where you wanna be in like 10, 15 years, like for me, I can only hope to buy my parents a house and all that, that might seem really far away, right? But if you condense the axis of time so that you know it's not that far away, like let's say tomorrow is 10 to 15 years, then I think if you look at the trajectory that you're currently at, you can think about whether or not you're gonna hit these goals or if it's possible or not. So what I'm saying is that if you're watching Netflix all day and you're just hoping for something to happen, it's definitely not gonna happen. But if you put in the work slowly, then the trajectory is higher and you might even do better than you expected. Update on my whole change the world with coding Elon Musk, Steve Jobs dream. It's, um, it's in progress. You just gotta trust the trajectory. So stay tuned. Okay, that's about it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you guys found the video entertaining and learned something. And that's about it. Peace.